All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Bella Irwin, and my TED Talk today considers the question, are dreams meaningful? So I'd like to begin with a question. How many of you have ever had a dream in which someone you know hurts your feelings, and you wake up really angry at them the next day, although you have no reason to be? Well, a doctor by the name of Dylan Selterman performed a study in which he asked 61 participants to report what kinds of dreams they had over a two-week period. 26% of the dreams contained romantic partners, and of that 26%, 36% had a conflict or a cheating experience. What Dr. Dylan Selterman found is that when someone had a dream about a conflict, that, that translated into more conflict the next day with their romantic partner. And similarly, infidelity translated into less love the next day. This got me thinking about if our dreams can affect our mood the next day, how much of it is really important and how much of it doesn't mean much at all. I started doing some research on the history of dream interpretation and what dreams meant to past civilizations. Dating back from 3000 to 4000 BC, primal societies used to document their dreams on clay tablets. They didn't have the knowledge to distinguish between the waking world and the dream world, so they saw the dream world as an extension of reality and just as important. To the Greeks and Romans, dreams were very important as well. They saw dreams as messages from the gods. Um, to Roman military leaders, they were especially important because they dictated war strategy. During the Hellenistic period, the Greeks put a special emphasis on dreams' ability to heal. There were temples set aside for patients to go and talk to doctors and dream interpreters about their dreams so that doctors could diagnose them. Egyptians used to document their dreams in hieroglyphics. Um, they saw dream interpreters, which were most often priests, as very divine. Perhaps dreams were the most important to Native American tribes. They were able to talk to their ancestors and the dead through dreams and through symbols such as plants. They also created the dream catcher. Now the dream catcher was created as a means primarily for women and children. It would capture the nightmares in the net or the web and the good dreams would flow down through the feathers back to the sleeper. In the 19th century, dreams were dismissed as stemming from anxiety and thus there was really no meaning to them anymore. It seems like past civilizations really respected their dreams and took time to understand what they meant. And now, very often, we wake up, forget our dreams, and don't even pay attention to them. There are three popular dream theories as to why we dream, although there's really no answer. The first theory is that dreams have a fixed meaning. So this is a sort of story um, fortune telling. So, for instance, an orange you see in your dream symbolizes good health. The second theory is one that many scientists take, and this is that dreams are just random electrical activity. So basically that they're inherently meaningless and that dreams are a way of our brain processing our emotions and the things that we experience throughout the day. And the third theory is that dreams have an unconscious importance to us. This theory was generated by a famous psychoanalyst, Sigmund Freud. He called it wish fulfillment. Basically what this meant to him is, if you listen to your dreams, it can benefit your life. All three of these dream theories have truth to them, but I like to believe in the third. I love this quote by Ernest Hartman, published in The Nature and Functions of Dreaming. Dreams contextualize emotional concerns using the language of picture metaphor. This led me to an answer to my question, my overall question, that dreams are essentially emotional processors. So our subconscious mind can tell us things in our sleep that we can't quite figure out in our waking state. Our lives are so busy these days that we don't take time to listen to our feelings, but those feelings will almost always arise in our dreams. A common example of this would be the common dream that you're driving down a steep hill or you're approaching a red light and you find that your brakes aren't working. This type of dream actually represents, in reality, a relationship that is unstable or unhealthy. So I wanted to figure out the connection between dreams and psychotherapy. I found out that when a patient visits a psychotherapist, all they can do is explain their dream in the way that it was experienced. Now, a lot of time they do this, it's very imperfect because they leave out a lot of detail. And usually the explanations are purely emotional. 
What this means for the therapist is that they're able to tell the patient's mental state and their psychological position. So you may have noticed that growing up, you've had much less nightmares than you did during your toddler years. And this is because childhood is, the childhood stage is a stage of very raw development. Now what this means is that the things we're afraid of as children, we haven't experienced in our real lives. As we get older, we experience the things we fear more and they become a little bit less scary to us. Thus our dreams dissipate naturally. Traumatic nightmares are a symptom of PTSD. Some very popular themes of traumatic nightmares would be loss of identity, threat to life, or threat of abandonment. Those who lost their homes in the fires last year may have a dream that they're stuck somewhere and there's no way to get out, while a feeling of danger is impending upon them. I read an article by a woman named Maria Popova titled Sleeping, Depression, and How Dreams Affect Our Emotions. So she did research on the brains of severely depressed individuals. What she found is that depressed individuals had much longer REM sleep stages. This means that they never quite got to that deep sleep stage where they were able to dream fully. Depressed individuals also had much lower HGH levels, and HGH is related to physical body healing, repair, and growing. So what this means is that dreams are essentially a way to stabilize us from the distractions as we sleep. Depressed individuals can't sleep as well because they can't quite get into that dream stage, but a stable individual would be able to sleep much better. I read the fiction piece of literature, The Kin of Ada Are Waiting For You by Dorothy Bryant. The kin essentially model their lives of, off of their dreams. So what they dream about, they listen to, and they live out their lives in response to that dream. This creates a utopian community, a very peaceful one. The narrator is a criminal who wakes up in, surrounded by the kin of Ada. He has a lot of nightmares, but he assimilates himself with the kin and quickly discovers a better way of existing. This is because he becomes more mindful of his dreams and what his subconscious mind is trying to tell him. We can do this by simply keeping a dream journal, or when we wake up, jotting down our dream and our notes on our phone so that we can remember them. I started looking at some art inspired by dreams. A lot of what I found was very psychologically twisting and abstract, such as this famous painting called Persistence of Memory, created by Salvador Dali in 1931. In this painting, Dolly was able to capture his phobias and his psychological terrors that he saw in this way during a dream. The droopy clocks represent time as a concept that loses all meaning in the unconscious world. Another piece of art that I analyzed was a painting called No Him by a 15-year-old artist, Dimitra Milan. She claims that all of her art is directly influenced by her dreams. If we use the dream theory fixed meaning and take a look at the symbol of the tiger, it puts a special emphasis on raw feeling and emotion. And it also, it also emphasizes the relationship, the intimate relationship between the woman and the tiger. I'd like to end my TED talk with this quote by Sigmund Freud, which sums up how important our dreams can be to us. The dream shows how recollections of one's everyday life can be worked in to a structure where one person can be substituted for another, where unacknowledged feelings like envy and guilt can find expression, where ideas can be, link can be linked by similarities, and where the laws of logic can be suspended. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk.